At all times, tracks, trail and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations disappeared, centuries-old dust swept capitals and cities. But roads kept on breathing life back into them. Do we really understand how roads revitalized areas hundreds of years ago and how they affect people's destinies today? We go on the Treasures of the Nation expedition to reveal facts about life at the crossroads of antiquity. Modern motorways are very much new, but if a trail is left, it will surely be found even thousands of years later. In this episode, who and why built a monument for Attila in France? Why did Attila spare Paris? How does this step spirit help the modern nomads of France? Since antiquity, the name of Attila, the king of the Huns, terrified the Europeans as much as it made proud his fellow countrymen. There are those who consider him a wild barbarian. There are those who think of him as a great hero. Yet what are the real traces left by Attila's soldiers in Europe, in addition to the frightening sound of his name? We are in Budapest, the capital of Hungary. Hungarians call their own country Magyar Orsak, or the land of Magyars. In the world, it is known as Hungary or the land of the Huns. It's not by accident, because by Huns led by Attila started their legendary campaign to the west exactly from here. To find whatever traces of Attila here in Hungary, we came to the Hungarian National Museum. Is it known where, say, was Attila's camp, or were whatever rather locations associated with the Huns? World scientists agree that Attila's base area, so to say, undoubtedly was located in Hungary. Although, as of today, there are no reliable data on the exact location of Attila's headquarters, we can safely claim that the heart of the Hunnic influence in the region were these areas here, the stab zones between the Danube and Tissa rivers. Eastern Hungary, the land that here they called Alfeld, is a lowland. At present, nobody can precisely point to the actual location of Attila's military camp, but the Huns did embark on their European campaign somewhere from here. This is where the legendary Attila's march on the west began. And today, we will hearten his heels. One word is enough to describe the city and say everything. Paris, the center of world art, the center of world gastronomy, the center of world science, the homeland of cinema, and merely the center of virtually everything in the modern world. Yet 1500 years ago, when this land was shaken by the scary news, the Huns were coming, Paris was still a small and little known town. In the spring of 451, the army of the staff nomads who had subdued the whole Europe approached Paris. Frankly, I'm not into this romanticism about Paris. 
I didn't go to the tower and didn't walk down Montmartre. Yet we thought it necessary to go to Notre Dame because... We'll not spoil it. Come with us and see for yourself. Here's Notre Dame, and now we'll have to climb 380 steps, which roughly makes it similar to the walk up to Lake Midair. Won't scare us. A piece of cake. So this is the goal of our journey, Notre Dame de Paris, the famous Gothic-style bestiary. Some scientists think that certain elements of its architecture were borrowed from the steps Scythian style. In fact, in those days, a lot of artistic elements and techniques came to these parts and spread around the world thanks to the migrations of the nomads of the Great Steppe. Europe did not escape this fate either. As we know, the Sarmatians and the Huns of King Attila had also reached these ends. This building was built in the 15th century by King Louis XV for his daughter. Nowadays, it hosts the National Assembly of France. It is also the building that keeps the picture of a famous French artist, Delacroix, until it tramples on Italy and the arts. The Pantheon, the sacral center of France constructed in the 18th century by King Louis XV in honor of Saint Genevieve who, as he believed, had saved him from a severe illness. This place keeps the ashes of the most famous French, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Voltaire and Victor Hugo. I'll tell why we are here after we come in. The Pantheon's interior is decorated with tremendously gorgeous frescoes illustrating France's history. Guess who is depicted on one of the first ones we see? King Attila himself. The thing is that Saint Genevieve lived exactly during the time of Attila's invasion of France. At that time, the whole country was in panic. Yet Saint Genevieve started praying God asking to prevent the Huns coming to Paris. Her prayers got heard and the Huns passed by the city. And since that time, Saint Genevieve is considered the savior of Paris. Most certainly, the saving of Paris was not done by the higher forces. Attila simply gathered his army near Paris to prepare for the attack against the then-powerful Roman fortress of Orleans. No doubt, the barbaric image of Attila and the Huns created by French artists was somewhat depressing. But we were sure that exciting discoveries were waiting for us around the corner. Grigory Tomsky, world-class UNESCO expert, member of the French Writers' Union and the author of multiple articles and books on Attila, has been studying the history of the Huns in France for many years. He immediately took us to Attila's parts.
Province was one of the strongest fortresses in the whole France. It is located close to the Catalonian plains where a large-scale battle between Attila and the Romans took place. For me, the most impressive thing about Attila is that his army had stormed many of such fortresses. Allegedly, in the course of his invasion of the Roman Empire, Attila stormed 300 towns and cities. And he did it with surprisingly great ease. How did he do it? They say the nomads, the wild and barbaric Huns riding horses, and all of a sudden they take fortified facilities. We shouldn't forget that when Attila was young, from 14 to 18 years of age, he lived and studied in the Roman Empire, specifically in Ravenna, in Rome. According to the ancient law of exchanging noble hostages, initially a young Roman aristocrat, Aetius, was sent to the Hunnic headquarters. There he got acquainted and even made friends with Attila. Then Attila came to Italy where he drank in learning and mastering the military science. In February 451, the Huns rushed into Gallia in several columns the classical nomadic Batu scheme. Dozens of big and small towns were taken in the course of six months thanks to the thoroughly planned and set-piece storming campaign. The vast areas in Western Europe, from Switzerland to the Atlantic, were taken under full control. Only when the powerful Roman fortress of Orleans had fallen, the imperial army headed by Commander Aetius advanced against the Huns from the south. The Huns turned around and started slowly moving to the northeast, to the Catalonian plains. The Romans followed them. We came to the small town of Romilis or Sand that witnessed many events connected with Attila. Prior to the arrival of the Huns, a certain Roman aristocrat by the name of Romilius had built his villa here. <laughs> Professor Tomsky lives in the city of Romilly. He intentionally bought a house in the Catalonian plains to be closer to the grandiose events that took place here 1500 years back. <laughs> Initially, I wrote a novel about Attila in French. Then they quickly translated it into Turkish, Mongolian and Russian, in Yakut, and then also into English. When Professor Tomsky's book about Attila was published in Turkey and presented at Istanbul Book Fair, it was deemed the main book of the year. Its advertisement poster carried the slogan from the steppes of Asia to the unity of Europe, and the book's title was translated into Turkish as Attila the First European. As the famous French Academy fellow Brion once wrote, political figures of all nations cannot deny that the ultimate goal of Attila one of the greatest kings in the world history was Europe's unity. So can we say that nowadays, in the 21st century, Attila's idea actually came to life here in Europe? Well, it turns out it did. They themselves admit it. Europe at the time of Attila was shared by three empires. Eastern Roman with a capital in Constantinople, Western Roman and the Hunnic that was also called the Northern Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire was defeated by Attila and was paying tribute to the Huns. The Western Roman Empire was de facto ruled by Commander Aetius, a friend of Attila's since teenage years. It appears that Attila indeed was not that far from the idea of uniting the whole Europe. As it turned out, Attila's traces can be found in close proximity to Paris. 
One of the most mysterious ones is a cross standing near the village of Orini Lusak. So this is the one? Yes, and even a more ancient one was probably standing here before this one. Okay. Yes, and it was called Attila's Cross for some reason. Could it have been Tengrian? Why not? The Honey Cross is only one among the riddles in the village of Origny. The second one is related to how the French call the locals, the Jukans. Why? He had confirmed that the village and the ancestors of village residents were under the honey cruel for some time. Jug in French means yoke or bondage. And this is the reason why the residents of these and some neighboring communities are called Jukens or Jugan. Did you see that green area over there? It's a forest and it has Attila's raven. So that was Attila's cross, and now we will go further out of the village. This section of the road is called Attila's Road. Can we go there now? Yes. So, as that young Zhuken has told us, the road at this end of the village is called Attila's Road. Indeed, this is the place where an ancient Roman road once went. So, both the Roman legions and Attila's soldiers marched it, no doubt, and the locals still remember it. Following Antilla's road slightly further out, we reach the town of Mary sur seine to actually touch the events of the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. So we just crossed the Seine River. Here on this map you can see where we are now, the Seine and the road we took to get here. This is where the huge camp of Attila's Germanic alleys, the Japets, under the leadership of Adaric, was located. After capturing Orleans, Attila's army advanced to the northeast, to the Catalonian plains. The Japheds infantry and the army's rear guard stopped near the village of Mary sur seine for an overnight. And then, when they were already asleep, the Franks' army approached from the side of Romilly. The Franks were a Germanic tribe that had two kings. One of them supported the Romans and the other one allied with Attila. The sleeping Japheds were attacked by the ones that were siding with the Romans. That was the beginning of the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. I prefer to call it a military engagement because it took place over vast areas. The Catalonian Plains represent an extensive valley in the northeast part of France. For the most part, this smooth area reminds the vast and open steppe space. Could it have been the reason why Attila decided to lead his troops exactly here for the decisive battle? The steppe cavalry could comfortably maneuver in these vast expenses. So with the defeat of the Jepedai, the beginning of the Catalonian battle turned out not that good for the Huns. While the Japheds were only an insignificant part of Attila's army, many other Germanic tribes were among his allies. Close to this place, a wealthy burial of a Germanic leader was found. The grave contained golden jewelry and two swords, which quite probably could have belonged to a Japedai king that met his death during that fatal night from a Frank plague. To see the swords, the expedition is going to the museum of the city of Troyes. Oh, 
Look at that. Indeed, this is an exciting moment for any representative of steppe nations. These swords are of the Hunnic era and belonged either to the Huns or their rallies. The golden artifacts that were found in the same grave are also made in the Hunnic style. Yes, it is very similar. The Catalonian plains keep yet another mysterious legend. Allegedly, the inhabitants of one of the local villages are the descendants of wounded Attila soldiers who were forced to stay here on the hands of the locals. During the conversation, the village resident has confirmed this legend known to each member of the community. Multiple studies indicate that from time to time, the children born here have the so-called Mongolian spots. I wish we could examine all the children in the village. At last, we have arrived at perhaps the main Attila's legacy on the territory of France. It has not only remained but was rethought and specifically highlighted by the present-day French. We are in the village of La Chape, also known as Attila's camp. There's even an Attila's monument. Wow! We could expect anything but a monument honoring Attila in France. Pierre Ribieu, a local historian and the first president of Attila Camp Association, and Pierre Bonnet, mayor of the village of La Chape, who have warmly welcomed us, put a lot of effort into this first and so far the only Attila monument in France. Attila is a part of our history and a famous and mythical personality. Ask any person, any school student, each of them will know something about who Attila was. In recent years, the very image of Attila has been changing. Thanks to new data and, in particular, the efforts of Professor Tomsky, we are starting to understand that Attila wasn't that wild barbarian as he was depicted previously. The monument is made of 10 mm thick steel, weighs 120 kilograms and consists of 100 details. 15 school students, 15 to 17 years of age, participated in the work. The opening ceremony took place June the 4th, 2012. A delegation from Kazakhstan took part in it. Attila is sitting on a white horse and is dressed in red clothes. I know that this color is popular among the Kazakhs. The circle around the rider's figure symbolizes the world as Attila is considered the subjugator of the world known at that time. The shape of the monument's stone foundation is not accidental either. It's done in the shape of a yurt. We warmly parted with the residents of the village of La Chape and presented them with souvenirs from Kazakhstan. Having done that, we rushed to the last destination of our journey, the place where Attila might have spent his last days before the most famous battle of antiquity. The street carries the name of Attila's camp. Celtic fortification. It says Celtic. Indeed, as the Celts and the Gauls are the same, they made it. Does it mean that this camp is not Attila's? Was it built by the Huns or...? No, no, the Huns of course didn't build it. It's a very complicated construction, so it took many years to build it. 
They simply used it. It's clear from the scale of this fortification that some regiment or a division lodged here. In spite of the fact that the fortification was not built by the Huns, the popular local memory still holds it as Attila's camp. Among other things, the fact that the culture of the Great Steppe is becoming increasingly popular in France can be considered yet another Attila's trace and the legacy of nomadic civilization. It's hard to imagine that selling Mongolian goods can be quite a successful business in France. These things are Kazakh, made by the Kazakhs of Mongolia. For many years, Jean-Baptiste has been keen on Mongolian culture. He worked as advisor at the French embassy in Mongolia and is married to a Mongol. In his current antiquarian business, the sale of yurts takes about 40% of the whole turnover. Who buys them anyway? Why would the French need yurts, seasonal workers, creative people and circus employees? People who travel a lot often buy them. My major customers, though, are small hotels and reception centers, as by means of yurts they can easily expand their useful area. How helpful are yurts in the hotel business? We talked about it with the owner of a real yurt camp located in Paris suburbs. As it turned out, it wasn't just a real hotel complex with 22 yurts, but also 26 rooms decorated in the Mongolian style. The meeting rooms in the hotel carry familiar nomadic titles. I always dreamed of traveling. I have been doing this for 35 years. I know the Sahara Desert very well and just returned from Egypt. But Mongolia, the land of true nomads, has always been my favorite. Nobody got it when Jacques brought his first year, but then suddenly started asking him to sell it. At that time, his travel agency business wasn't doing well and he had to close it. Yet since the time Jacques engaged in the yurt business, things started looking up again. Every year we hold 140 weddings and 70 seminars here. In addition to group events, people come here to do meditation or yoga. Some just want to have a sleep in a yurt. They say it's very pleasant. In modern France, there are people who are knowledgeable about not only yurts, but also the nomadic military art. Christian is a professional military and served in many hot spots around the world. He examined the military art of various eras and nations in great detail. As an experienced reenactor and as the owner of an extensive arsenal, Christian notes the ability of the nomads to create weapons from simple things. Our expedition was leaving France with a pleasant feeling. Despite 1500 years that have passed since the time when the Huns had been here, Attila's traces have nevertheless remained. Although not all of them are positive, more and more of the French begin to see the nomads not as wild barbarians and destroyers as it was represented by the European propaganda. We can confidently say that Attila was a great leader and military commander. For those times, he was a real tough guy, and we can only congratulate Attila on his successes. The nomads always keep their word. They are hardworking, can bear harsh climatic conditions, and never complain. They are also very hospitable. I very much like them and share their values. The most striking thing is the ancient nomadic philosophy, Tengriism, which is about staying close to the nature and tolerance, which are both becoming very popular nowadays. Personally, my principles are very similar, and I can safely call myself a Tengriist.